All right, now, what's the deal, my young man? I was born in Vancouver, Collingwood East, and uh, that's uh, 1916. I moved with the family to a place called Steelhead, and uh, we lived there. I started school in Steelhead. And I can recall the first few times we had to, no road between our homestead and the school, so we had to go down what they call a skid road, where they hauled out shingle bolts on a sleigh. And it was about a kilometer and a half we had to walk every day to get down to school. Uh, that's a long, long time ago. I don't remember too much, but I do remember the starting school there. After that, we moved down to Burnaby, where I got the, the rest of my education. Now, I didn't get a hell of a lot of education because I left school at about grade seven. And, uh, and uh, then went with my brother horse logging poles in steelhead. And, and from that, we started logging with machinery. My brother was quite a, quite a, a good negotiator, whatnot, and he negotiated a deal up on Texada Island, uh, where we logged for quite a while, and uh, unfortunately he got killed up there. That was the end of my logging business. I started then working for the other guy for quite a number of years. Uh, I worked up at Rock Bay for about three or four years, setting chokers and and uh, whatnot. But that wasn't much of a life, so I moved out of there and went to Hope, where we had some better life, nightlife. Eh? From there, I wound up in the Squamish, and that was about 1938. And I've been here more or less back and forth ever since. I was away for quite a while during the war working in the shipyards. We built the 10,000 ton freighters to getting goods and material over to England. When that ceased, uh, I came to Squamish and went to work for Empire Mills at Alta Lake. I worked there uh, for quite some time, I uh, I finally got a notice to go to the army, and uh, uh, the powers to be in Empire Bill said, "No, no, you stay there. Uh, we'll uh, I'll go and uh, straighten that out for you." That was a deferment into the army. Anyway, I uh, stayed there, and he went my place. Well. He was successful and I still continued to get my demerits and stayed there and logged. Now then after that I logged for <coughs> and put logs in Lost Lake up at, uh, up at Whistler and uh, they drifted across to the mill and they made 6 by 8s and 8 by 10s and whatnot, uh, shipping to England to rebuild England. The fall of that year I moved down to Squamish and uh, and uh, Empire Mills said, bring the machine down with you. 
and so I did and I started in contracting for for them I uh, formed my first company House on Timber in uh, uh, 1944 I guess I still have that company uh, a bunch of guys we got together and one fella come in named Pat Brennan uh, which did a little bit of drinking and he, he, I don't know whether I should say this or not, but his dad used to tell me that one thing I did with all my family, I made sure they had a good education and then I suggest I, I kicked them out and said, whatever you do, son, make sure you're the best at it. Well, this Pat Brennan, my, that turned out to be my partner, he was the best alcoholic in town, or anywhere for that matter. Anyway, he come along one time and he said he's gonna, he wants to go into business with me. And I said, well, I think you're by the last guy I want to go into business with, with that kind of a, uh, uh, with your liquor business. So, well, oh no, I'm gonna quit that, which uh, they all say, but not many do. So anyway, after that, it, uh, I decided, well, what the hell? He's got a lot on the ball, and if he quits drinking, he could be a good partner. So we did form a company. Pat was quite successful in running the business, and uh, he took one end of it, and I took the other end. He took all the logging, and et cetera, et cetera. I took the machinery end of it on, and finance. We got along real well. One of the most important things we brought up and this from, was from the knowledge we had with other organizations within this area, was tell your wife nothing, nothing. Because uh, there were some organizations that the wives got mixed up and uh, my husband works more than your husband, and this and that, and that thing, and, and pretty soon those companies dissolve. So we That's didn't it. want that to happen. Of course, they were both blown, blown up about that. They didn't like it a damn bit, but it worked excellently. When we went to a party, they had nothing to fight about, the two women. They knew nothing. We kept it that way, and we stayed in businesses until poor Pat died. He joined the AAs in U.S. Minister with a friend of his, a well-known lawyer, uh, and uh, is sobered up. And he came back to Squamish and started up the uh, 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 Alcoholics Unanimous, and immediately had quite a good group there. Pat. <laughs> in a sense, came from the bottom to the absolute top. From there, he just worked himself right up to the top as mayor. And I got to say one thing, and a lot of other people do, it's about the best mayor we ever, ever had and probably ever will have. And we were always in politics, uh, helping who we thought would do the best job federally and provincially. We, we weren't in it to get anything. That wasn't Pat's idea on anything. That underhanded stuff. He, he had nothing to do with that ever. It's all above board. That's one thing about him. Everything had to be above board. Between him and the district, uh, the, the, the provincial government, they decided they were going to dike the river and change the course so that it wouldn't come through town anymore. And Pat and his group took on that job, and they did it, and they did it for far under budget, and a very, very good job. Well, I'd like to, I'd like to tell you a little bit about how we first uh, met John. Was, uh, of course, I, I married his sister, so that helped. And uh, we, uh, uh, we didn't know exactly what we wanted to do in our life. We were looking for different things to do for work and stuff. And, well, he said, we'll give you a job up in Squamish. I said, what doing? He says, logging. He says, well, log. Show you how to log. So I thought that was pretty good. So we, uh, 
we come up to Squamish. First place he put us in was the old powerhouse down by the uh, what was the old red bridge. Well, it had no insulation in it. We uh, we pretty near froze to death the first year. We had a <laughs> we had a, a sawdust hopper there, and it froze up. The kids we had him sitting on the chair with his feet in the oven to try and keep him warm. And this was the house he gave us when we first come to Squamish. However, we did get up here, and uh, he got me started logging, and and uh, I thought this is going to be an easy touch. Well, and after a couple of days in the woods, I'd come home and I could already walk. I was, it was absolutely unbelievable how tough that work was to get started at. You run up and down side hills and, and it got, uh, got pretty uh, tough going for a while. He's quite a guy. He was the first one to bring a grapple loader into the valley. He was the first one to bring a steel spar into the valley. I had the thing built at Barad Dry Docks and uh, I gotta say it was a very, very successful thing. Uh, where we used to take as much as three days from production at this site to production at that site, it was cut down to maybe four to six hours, which was, a, which was a, quite a big item in the logging. And that was the steel spar. Uh, we used to have with the wooden tree, a uh, boom, what swung around the tree to pick up logs to put on the trucks. There was two tongs involved, but I designed one with a one tong, which I call the heel boom. That was the heel in the tree. Then, uh, in discussions with a salesman, uh, he talked me into buying a mobile log loader. So I went along with them and uh, bought a small machine and equipped it with a boom and a tong, and it worked like a charm. However, shortly after that, this grapple business came into light, which meant you didn't need any people out there to set tongs. One of the first was the uh, sky hook. Uh, it was a machine that traveled on a pair of big cables and and uh, it used to sit in and drive it around. There was a witch that you let down, pick up logs and transported them. But one night, I remember clearly, the, it raining like hell and the river came up high. And uh, of course that meant the high tide backed the river up. So I got all the boys in there, hoisted them up, shackled the cage to the machine, and away I go across the river. Well, uh, unfortunately, the tide had come in and the river was up, and the cage hit the water. And if you could hear, listen to the language that went on in that cage with water flying through there, and uh, Anyway, as soon as we got through the, from the low spot and the cables and started up again, we were out of the river. Uh, it was actually not a dangerous thing because we just barely hit the water, maybe. But it put water right straight through the cage. We really didn't fight too much amongst ourselves. On the, uh, we got along very, very, very well with everybody else. Or CRB were the biggest uh, along with us. We were uh equal i suppose and uh and but we got along quite well together right now it's uh the markets are fair we can get by but we're not making any great money but things are looking a little bit better with the chinese being a little bit interested in uh the species that is more or less left now some of the people I uh, used to work with, uh, Al McIntosh, I, uh, he came to Squamish probably about five years after I did. I knew Al pretty good, pretty good guy actually. He, was, uh, he used to work for J.D. And uh, J.D., of course, you know, he was a uh, logger and uh, he always was watching expenses. Uh, he didn't want to spend any nickels if he didn't have to. We were down south in Yuma, 
staying at this um, uh, RV park. And uh, his sister stayed there too. And he came over from where he was staying over in Palm Springs to visit. And of course, we knew him pretty good. So we went over and was having a few beers with him and all. And uh, we got talking about this and that and the other thing. And Johnny, he looked at me and he, and uh, I said, you know what, John? Well, I was the first employee at Squamish Mills. And he looked at me and here I had a place down there and this nice camp and stuff. And he says, obviously, he says, we paid you too much. Well, Johnny, although a lot of people had a lot of things against him, but there was a lot of people when they got right down to it said that Johnny was pretty good. He supplied a lot of work for a lot of people. He had, uh, he started out uh, house on timber and I think he had two or three or four trucks, logging trucks working, plus a uh, uh, couple of yarders working for him. And he did a lot of work in Squamish and he wasn't nearly as tough as a lot of people thought. Not nearly as tough, he was really a good guy. And to this very day, yeah. Yes, well, as far as my family's concerned, uh, uh, I used to have to go to the telephone office to phone every once in a while. At that time, there was only one phone in town, and uh, that was in a little f a phone office downtown there, and this young kid that was in there named Colleen, she would obviously listen to all my calls. Anyway, one night she asked me to come to a party down there, please. And I said, holy Christ, I'm not going to fool around with you kids. She was still going to school. But uh, anyway, the thing there was, she kept at me and at me, and then her mother saw the potential, and they said, she said to call him, by, there's a good catch, catch him. And of course, that was it. We had figured on six kids but we got twins the last time so now we have uh, four girls and three boys my mother she uh, didn't really like care for John very much and she used to say to John as when we they used to t take it to the the gate and say good night and she'd yell out John Drinker you leave my daughter alone you go home and leave my daughter alone. <laughs> because poor John wasn't very popular around Squamish at that time. But he kept persisting and he kept persisting. And he kept coming back. And finally, my mom got to really like him. So we, we went around for two years. He courted me for two years and uh, we finally... We finally got married on the 21st of June, 1947. So we went on a nice honeymoon. He took me down to San Francisco and Brookdale Lodge and uh, down in California. And, and he, uh, when we were away, he had his brother-in-law, Nels, build this little prefab home. So when we got back, our home was all ready to move into. And it was right on the main street, right across from, right on Cleveland Avenue. And pretty soon, we, we weren't there for very long before I became in the family way with Jay, our first. They're all well, doing well. I got no complaints with any of them. They're all doing quite well. And we're, Colleen's really happy. She spends more time with the kids than she does with me. And uh, most of all our kids are around us now, except one in uh, Kelowna. Uh, I gotta say that she got a good catch, but so did I. <laughs> oh, pretty bossy. And he always wanted his own way. And he eventually got it. And uh, but on the whole, we, we, we've we been married 63 years now, and uh, he, he, John's gotten older, and I'm looking after him more, keeping him happy, or trying to. <laughs>
Another little story I'd like to, to tell you about was uh, the story about uh, the girls knitting JD a bathing suit of all things. Well, we bought a motor home and we were taking little side trips and we stopped in at Bermuda Dunes where uh, John and Colleen lived and asked if they wanted to take a little side trip with us. And so we decided we were going to take a run up to a court site in, in uh, Arizona. So uh, we stopped in court site and it's uh, quite a place that they have all these rock, uh, rock hounds there and one thing or another. And, where we're looking through stores and, and finally found a spot there with some knitting needles. So we bought two sets of knitting needles and a uh, couple of colors blue uh, uh, wool for them to do their knitting and in the motorhome we get and we're on our way. We didn't know how to really put a bathing suit, a knitted bathing suit together. So she knit the front and I knit the back. And the back was big and the front was small. So. Anyway, and he wanted to put a, he wanted to have a little flap at the front to hide all his, his things, you know. <laughs> so we had to knit this little flap to go and, 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 you know, to cover him up at the front. I still have that bathing suit upstairs. Anyway, he wasn't shy. He put it on. He was heading to the pool. Of course, when you get in the pool, the bagging suit started to sag. It was leaving where it was supposed to be and heading down to his knees. So he come out holding the thing up. So then the girls got busy and they knit a couple of, uh, of straps to put on and put over his shoulder to hold it up. I'll tell you, it was something to behold. All the years here in Squamish, uh, whoever come up with an idea for recreation, it seemed that the, everybody got behind them. Uh, one of the first things that we did of any major was the curling club. Well, being a logger, I didn't have a clue about curling. However, I, like a lot of other people, all the loggers got in behind the people that wanted a curling club. and. Uh, we were very, very successful. We had four sheets of ice up there and it was a great recreation. Everybody thoroughly enjoyed it all winter long. Uh, that was one of the projects. Uh, uh, one of the other ones was the golf course. We made application uh, to get the area, which is 140 acres where it is now. And Ray Wilson being the Minister of Lands at that time, and Brennan and him being quite friendly, we had no problems. Uh, everybody pitched in with all the logins, with their equipment and whatever help they could give. And it was more or less earmarked by, or uh, run by uh, 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 Gordy McKay, which became the pro, and laid out the golf course. And, uh, and Lloyd Ingram was very active, and all the rest of us supplied machinery and helped wherever we could. Of course, we had a annual uh, tournament and a, a, a beef barbecue, beef on the mud barbecue, which I brought to town many years ago. I had a call one day from a friend of mine, Johnny Morrison. Uh, he used to be up here running uh, McKenzie's. A general store and he he said John I want you to get five or six uh, local businessmen that are quite interested in the economy and the community together I'm coming up and I will talk about making a, a Rotary Club well he convinced me so I did and uh, and we all sat down and discussed the thing. The outcome was, was yes, we would start a Rotary Club, uh, which we did. A group of us, some of the same guys actually that started Logger Sports got together and formed a, a ski club. So we wanted a place to ski. We went up to Alice Lake and we'd water ski up there. The odd person would come up for a bit of a, you know, swim or sunbathe or that, whatever it was. And, uh, of course, John, he'd take a trip up there. A couple of incidents, uh, incidents actually up there. He was up there and they went up for a swim with uh, two or three people and there was, uh, there was a uh, man having problems out in the water. And uh, him and uh, Gordon Gibson, who was uh, an ex-MLA in British Columbia, were there. They went, both of them, they were swimming out there. They actually saved, 
saved the guy's life, got him into, uh, and got help, and got him to the hospital. And uh, after that, he's decided, you know, maybe we should uh, make this a little easier for getting in and out with the people and that. So he instrument, was instrumental in starting the Alice Lake Park. He got a lot of people to help, and everybody went up, and they were digging and putting sand in and making beaches. And it wasn't long after that that they made a Class A park out of it. Of course, they kicked us off. It was too small a lake to have boats on power boats. Well, many years ago, uh, the community was small, but uh, there was two or three times everybody took a collection up to build a swimming pool, but nothing ever happened. In the meantime, there were uh, quite a number of drownings. That brought to light the, that we definitely needed a swimming pool or something to uh, teach the young people how to swim. I gotta say there was absolutely no shortage of help. Just as soon as the, the idea was started, everybody was there. The community wasn't very big, so everybody wasn't a hell of a lot of people, but everybody showed up and uh, the end result is uh, we built the swimming pool uh, that was um, behind the school and uh, a, a lot of people learn how to swim with that pool. The only plans for the future is, is that I'm going to stay put here as long as I can. I'm thinking seriously of retiring, but uh, everybody I know that's retired have uh, more or less, you know, co collapsed and died, eh? Uh, practically every one of my friends, they're all gone. Poor Oliver is gone. He sure was able to talk me into a, a lot of things. Work, building his business interests and employing hundreds of local residents, John Dranka, or JD as he's known by his close associates, has become a legend in his own time. So um, at this point, we'd like to turn the microphone over to you. Who would be the first victim? I mean, um, who would like to stand up and say something about John Dranka? But no one, I think, has made an impact on this community like John Dranka has. And I think it's because he cared. He can ask anyone in his family, and he cares. You can ask about his employees, and you'll find a loyal group of employees, many of them here tonight. I just wanted to say publicly today that he and John Lowe in particular have been so supportive to me, always concerned about my personal welfare and my, my, political, uh, my political success, and both patiently teaching me a lot about life. You're a special man, John. And Colleen, I admire you. I'm nice. See you all the interest. How he bosses you around. <laughs> he respects what we say. He does what we tell him. He steals our recipes. He asks for our opinion all the time. So I just want to quell that right now. He loves food. He didn't and he didn't let us, he didn't let us have any slack time. We were very happy to be working, and I know for a fact that as soon as I kept walking, he either had me up with a you know, telling the newspapers or greasing the trucks or something. I, I respect that, and that's probably going to make me a better man because I, and my daughters and everybody I know know, they, they all they need to work in there. There's no slacking off. So. You know, uh, you talked about that boat. I remember going to the christening of the boat, and my good friend uh, Schwory was there, and he was part of the MC, saying a few things about it. One thing, and he said, Well, one thing about it, JD put a glass bottom in the boat so we could look at the rest of the Hungarian Navy. <laughs> and John had just got his first boat and uh, he'd been out the house on somewhere and he caught this fish. And he was so bloody proud of this thing because he didn't catch any fishes. John Morris had tested. Anyways, uh, here he was, they had a picture taken with this fish, you see, and he was proud as hell. So he was shown it to these crew on this cruise ship. 
and they were more Norwegians, say, eh? and and the North, the, the, all of the officers were Norwegians. And anyway, this young guy looked at it, and he looked at the picture, and he looked at John, and then he looked at the picture again. And this, of course, John standing there holding his feet. And finally, he says, "Which one are we?" <laughs> many, many grand, grandkids and great-grandkids. 